the title of my talk was relating to uh, you know, what potential role uh, the urinary microbiome and the gut microbiome have in relation to urology. Um, so, you know, the, the urinary microbiome is a relatively new entity and um, people don't often think that the, the microbiome plays much of a role in urology. But uh, that, that's not actually true and, and it goes beyond uh, urinary tract infection. So people think of uh, bacteria in urology and think of urinary tract infection. And you know, I'm sure that, that that's important and we're learning a lot more about it and we've got a lot more to learn. But actually the, the bladder itself has you know, its own microbiome. It doesn't have a lot of uh, microbes. We know that it has bacteria. We don't, no one's really looked at other uh, microorganisms. Um, our work uh, has actually also looked at above the bladder, so the kidneys and, and also, um, I didn't talk about it today, we're interested in uh, ureteral stents and we know that biofilms and that they pretty quickly become colonised with bacteria that shouldn't be there. Um, so we, we, we've also done studies uh, looking at kidneys that have been taken out of people and uh, th there's not many bacteria that get up there but we, we can detect bacteria there. So you have to be very careful when you're analysing microbiome, especially in places where there isn't many bacteria expected and there's a lot of risk from the contamination by environmental samples and the inherent risks of the technology that we use. So we use PCR-based um, amplification and then sequencing of those PCR products. So under certain circumstances you can amplify the wrong thing or you know the, the contaminants and that will give you a false result. So we had to put a lot of um, development into um, creating methodologies that ensured that we weren't contaminating our samples and were giving us a, a result too. And we also went back and started using uh, more old-fashioned techniques. Um, Alan Wolf's group in Chicago has uh, re-pioneered um, some of the culture work for um, the, the urinary tract and uh, using extended culture. We can now actually grow some of the bacteria from those sites. Where clinical samples, they only look for some of the pathogens which are easy to grow and uh, you know, relatively straightforward. So, yeah, so, so we're interested in the urinary microbiomes. So uh, it could potentially have a role in a number of diseases. So we've done some preliminary work in bladder cancer. We presented some bladder cancer microbiome work today. It actually, uh, the urinary microbiome doesn't show a correlation if you have bladder cancer or not, but we're taking a sample which is urine from the whole bladder where as the, the, the bladder cancer samples that we're interested in are just small, um, small tumours in reality. And so unless you have a field change, you may not actually see a, a microbiome change. So we all want to find the magic uh, bullet of you know what's causing bladder cancer whether you know beyond the, the carcinogens or whether it's the, the microbes converting things to carcinogens you know we want those magic markers as well so at present the technology uh, doesn't really allow for that the early tumors are typically ablated by the urologist as soon as they see them so we don't get that sort of material and maybe later on uh, the, the bigger tumours that are not necessarily representative of those the, the early tumour environment. I, I'm not a cancer specialist, but that's sort of my perception. A lot of what ends up uh, being produced from the gut, and you probably talked to other people today about, you know, it's a major metabolic um, organ that um, a lot of that will come into the host and out through the urinary system. So we're interested in that and we're interested in a number of different things. We're interested in uh, drugs that um, are involved in reducing androgen and prostate cancer. So we know that some of those drugs are 
you know, really insoluble. They, they, you take them orally, they spend a long time in your uh, digestive tract. They're in the presence of, you know, bacteria for, for a significant amount of time. And that allows them the opportunity to interact with them. So sometimes uh, they will utilise those as carbon sources. In other cases, they'll be antimicrobial. So when you start taking these agents, you, you change a lot of things. You, you start to modify the microbiome, you're depleting testosterone. Um, you're changing a lot of the major important physiological things that are going in your body. We have testosterone for a reason. Um, so we're interested in that and we're interested in that, you know, so there's some recent studies which show that uh, the microbiome can influence the regulation of testosterone and that's very important in prostate cancer because uh, prostate cancer is driven by testosterone and uh, so the, the, the drugs are being modified by the bugs so that might have an influence on efficacy. But on the other hand, if they're also uh, potentially um, regulating testosterone levels, you know, that might provide an opportunity to reduce testosterone in men by a female fecal transplant. Um, and you know, we've got preliminary uh, data that su suggests that certain androgens are being produced by bacteria. So the, it's like the microbiome is starting to compensate uh, for the deprivation of androgens in the host system and that it kicks into action and may potentially play a role in why some of those drugs become resistant. We'd like to do more things. Um, there's a few technical issues to overcome. So how do we get access to those small tumours? So we are not uh, Imperial College and we're not the NIH. So th the methodology that I'd probably employ was some would be something like single cell sequencing and then do the microbiome of each cell. And I know that uh, you know, I collaborate with uh, some bladder cancer diagnostic companies and they can uh, get very good signatures off very low numbers of cells. So we'd, we'd like to maybe eventually correlate you know, some of the diagnostic readouts of single cells in relation to the microbiome that's on the surface. Now that's a technically challenging thing to do and we're going to have to learn some skills to do that. I think it's um, absolutely it has a role, um, but we need to learn a lot more. This is a very new field. The urinary microbiome's only been described since 2011. The, the interaction of these uh, drugs has never been described. This is the uh, xenobiotic metabolism side is a very new area. Um, as essentially, any ingested oral drug could be modified or changed by the microbiome, yet there's no studies on really just about any drugs. We know um, that metformin now, there's a couple of papers in Nature which show that some of the benefit of metformin comes from the uh, microbial xenobiotic metabolism and, and producing some of the short chain fatty acids. I mean, it could mean a whole lot of things. Maybe it would give us markers to start off with, maybe so we'd know that you've got the right bugs, um, that sort of thing. The Japanese in the 1980s, 90s and early 2000s did studies with probiotics. Um, some of the human studies that they did showed a lot of promise, but they had their weaknesses. Uh, we have a lot more technology now. We should go back and revisit those. So they show, because bladder ca cancer is very recurrent, they could show that it reduced recurrence. So simply a dietary change introducing a probiotic may have some effect um, in that population. At, at the very sort of simplest of manipulations, you know, in time we might be able to, you know, do other sorts of manipulations. So, you know, people have done fecal transplants. What about urine transplant? Or maybe that's too crude. Maybe, uh, you know, we can derive very specific drugs that target certain pathways that, you know, that lead to whether it be protection or disease. You know, th th there's a whole lot more to be done. Mm -hmm.